Are you ready? It's the time. It's the time you've been waiting for. It's the time I've been waiting for. It's a little bit late this week. It's already Wednesday, but I'm in the Torch Center in Houston, Texas. This is the Parsha Podcast. We are about to begin the best hour of your week. And I was thinking, how fortunate are we? How lucky are we? We get to spend an hour together each week on the Parsha Podcast with the Parsha Podcast family, studying Torah, spending quality time together, becoming wiser together, learning about our great antecedents and the stories of the Torah, absorbing the lessons of the Parsha each week on the Parsha Podcast from the Torch Center. What an amazing privilege. Speaking of this privilege, this week, a kind user named, creatively, BBK31122 submitted an amazing and very nice Review, five-star review on iTunes to the Parsha Podcast. The title of the review was So Awesome, five stars. And the text was, I learned so much last week and was able to share at my Shabbos table and really impressed our family and friends. Exclamation point, exclamation point. Thank you so much, BBK31122 via Apple Podcasts. Thank you so much for the kind review. I'm glad you were able to impress your family and friends. That's what we do here on the Parsha Podcast from the Torch Center. We impress family and friends, and hopefully, most importantly, we impress ourselves, and we impress the Almighty. Now, I want to remind everyone that ever since school started, I've been working really hard each week to produce a newsletter. And thank God it's been a bunch of weeks in a row that we have released a newsletter on Thursday. And this week's newsletter, spoiler alert, in my opinion, is going to be the best one yet. So if you don't like this week's newsletter, I cannot possibly reach the standards that you have. And I think it's a little bit of a problem because if you read this week and you're like, wow, that's, that's pretty good. That sets the bar too high. So when you read this week's newsletter, do me a favor and just set the expectations one notch lower, maybe two notches, two notches lower each week for the newsletter. Now, if you're saying, wait a minute, newsletter, I'm listening to a podcast. Podcast, well, that's that's audio. The newsletter, that must be written. Well, that's true. The newsletter comes in an email format. If you would like to have the newsletter sent to your email, there's a few things that you could do. You could actually go to the podcast description. The podcast that you're listening to right now has a description, some words to describe what we do. Scroll down a little bit, and near the link to click to give a donation to Torch, there's also a link to click to go subscribe to the newsletter. Put in your information, and you will get the newsletter delivered to your inbox Hopefully each week, with the help of the Almighty, it'll be each week. I'm working really hard to try to do it. Some weeks, I'm not promising to do it every week. I'm going to try. Now, there have been some people that have been complaining that they have not gotten the weekly newsletter, and most likely their inbox, for whatever reason, flagged it as spam. So if you subscribe and haven't gotten it, it's probably in your spam folder just go drag it into the regular inbox and you should be good thenceforth. So that's the newsletter. Thank you for the five-star review, Mr. or Mrs. or Miss or whatever pronoun. BBK31122. I appreciate that. And if you want to support the podcast, you want to support your friends at the Torch Center, your friends at the Parsha Podcast, you too can submit a five-star review on Apple Podcast, of course. Our organization subsists solely on the generosity and the donors of our friends and listeners, torchweb.org. Links are all in the description. And let's begin this week's edition of the Parsha Podcast. Let's go. So our Parsha, Parsha's Chaisar, is divided into three parts. The first part we spoke about at great length last year. I made the mistake of actually looking at my notes from last year. I'm like, oh my gosh. It was such a good podcast last year. There's no way to be topped. Big mistake. 
don't ever look at last year's notes before you're done with this year because it may make you a little bit disenchanted. But the first part of the parasha talks about the death and the eulogy and the burial and the securing of a burial spot for Sarah. The middle part, act two of the parsha, is the saga, the journey, the odyssey that Eliezer, the servant of Abraham, takes to go secure a wife, to go find a wife for Isaac. And of course, he eventually finds Rebecca and brings her back to Canaan. And the end of the parsha talks about Abraham's other wife and other kids and Abraham's death and the legacy of Ishmael. In this podcast, we're going to focus on the story of Eliezer traveling to Haran, traveling to Aram Naharaim to go find a spouse for Isaac, to go find Rebecca. And specifically, I want to focus on the protagonist of this story, Abraham's servant, Abraham's messenger and emissary, the man we know as Eliezer. He, in fact, was called Eliezer in Scripture in Parshas Lech Lecha. Now, who was Eliezer? So we know that he was Abraham's right-hand man. He controlled Abraham's assets. He was the controller of Abraham's affairs. He's Abraham's servant. He's the one who doled out Abraham's Torah to others. He's also a Canaanite. And he is conscripted by Abraham to go find a spouse from Abraham's family, a spouse for Isaac. And he travels east, and he eventually... After a very interesting story and saga, he comes back with Rebecca. Now, before Abraham dispatches Eliezer, he makes him swear an oath to not take a wife for Isaac from the Canaanites. Go to my family instead. And he undertakes the whole journey. And that is chapter 24 of our Parsha. It is, I believe, the longest chapter in the book of Genesis and one of the longest chapters in the whole Torah. So here's the question I want to pose to begin our analysis into this story. Abraham needs a wife for Isaac. Isaac, after all, is Abraham's successor. Abraham has other sons, but Isaac is the one who is going to fulfill the legacy of Abraham. And finding an appropriate spouse is critical. Yet Abraham sends an emissary. Why doesn't Abraham go himself? Now, of course, we could also ask the question, why doesn't Isaac go himself? And the answer to that, we know. Isaac was not allowed to leave the land of Israel, Canaan at the time. Once Isaac was designated as a sacrifice in the binding of Isaac's story in last week's Parsha, he is barred from leaving the land. In fact, in next week's Parsha, Parsha told us there's a famine and Isaac wants to leave the land and God stops him. You have to live in Israel. So Isaac definitely cannot go. But Abraham should do it himself, you would imagine. This is, after all, the future of the Jewish people. Why would you entrust this mission in the hands of a subordinate? And in fact, it's interesting because Abraham is not a million percent confident in Eliezer He's all worried that he's maybe going to supplant a different wife and he makes him swear to follow Abraham's instructions. Did Abraham trust Eliezer? It seems like he trusted him enough, but not fully. He makes him swear. Do it yourself. You want it done properly. Do it yourself. Question number one. Question number two. Some background over here. This is not the first time that Abraham sent Eliezer on a mission. It's actually most likely the third time that Abraham sent Eliezer on a mission. The first was to Sodom. Now, this is not featured in Scripture, but the Talmud tells us, the book of Sinatra, page 109b, it's talking about the state of the people of Sodom and Gomorrah in Olam Abba. It says the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, Sodom and Gomorrah, don't have a portion in the afterlife. And it's discussing some of the laws, the corrupt and perverse laws of Sodom. And it tells, in the middle of the narrative, it tells of Eliezer's exploits when he visited Sodom. It tells us that in Sodom, they had a crazy law that if someone hits you, if someone punches you in the nose, it makes you bleed. So normally you would arrest, you know, the person who did the assault. Not in Sodom. 
In Sodom, the victim had to pay the perpetrator. Someone punches you in the nose and you have to pay the person who punches you. Why? Because in antiquity, there was a process, a medicinal process called bloodletting. Release some blood. They punched you in the nose. They made you bleed. After all, you you have to pay for your services. They rendered services for you because they made you bleed. And therefore, you have to pay them. Crazy law. So it tells that Eliezer, this is the Talmud book of century 109b, Eliezer, the servant of Abraham, he was in Sodom. And someone went and started beating him up. So Eliezer says, oh my gosh, I'm going to drag the guy to court. He drags the person to court. This guy beat me up. He has to pay me. He caused me damage. The judge said to him, no, you got it wrong. You have to pay him. He did a service for you. So Eliezer outfoxed the system. He takes a stone and he throws it at the judge and makes him bleed. And he tells the judge, now you owe me money because I made you bleed. So whatever money you owe me, just pay it to that guy. And he stormed at the building. And then it tells another story. In Sidom, they had a bed of procrustes. Any guest was welcome. Come in. Join us. Here's some hospitality. Here's a bed. And the bed was a very specific length. And of course, some people are taller and some are smaller. Big fish, little fish, red fish, blue fish. Everyone's different sizes. So if someone was a little bit shorter, they'd stretch his limbs out. They'd almost dismember him because you have to fit the bed. And if someone's a little bit too long, they would just shave off some of his, they would amputate his legs to make him fit. Just obviously total corruption. But that's what they would do. And they would say to the guest, come sleep on our bed. And of course, once you get on the bed, you're either going to suffer the pain of dismemberment of one variety or the pain of amputation. So what did Eliezer do? How did he outfought the system? He said to him, listen, since my mother died, I I made a promise. I took a vow. Once she died, I can never be happy. And one of the things that I checked upon myself is that I'm not going to sleep in a bed. And if I only sleep on the floor, I'm not going to go onto your bed. And then it tells another story. It says that they had a particular law that if someone invites a foreigner to a wedding, they were very wary. They hated newcomers, immigrants, and they wanted to stamp out any hospitality. So they said, if you invite a foreigner, a guest, someone who's not part of our clique, you invite someone like that to a wedding, you're going to be stripped naked. So Eliezer walks into a wedding. And this side, of course, freaks out everyone out. Who invited him? What's he doing here? So Eliezer sits at the back and some guy comes over to him and says, "Uh, excuse me, sir, who invited you? So he says to him, who invited me? You invited me. And the guy realizes, oh no, if people find out, they're going to strip me naked. He runs out of the building. And then a second guy approaches Eliezer and says, who invited you? Who invited me? You invited me. The guy freaks out. Runs out of the building. I don't want to be stripped naked. Eventually, it's just Eliezer himself there by the wedding alone. And he had plenty to eat. These are three of the stories Talmud tells us in the book of Sanjay, page 109b, about Eliezer in Sodom. So, of course, it's a cute story how Eliezer outfoxed the evil sinners of Sodom. But there's still a basic question here. What was Eliezer doing there. We know he was Abraham's servant. And if he was in Sodom, you would imagine that the reason why he was there is because Abraham wanted him to go there. It seems like Abraham dispatched Eliezer on a mission to Sodom. Why? So we don't know, but we're just speculating. We know that Abraham wanted to change the people of Sodom. He stationed his tent so that way passerby coming in and out of Sodom would encounter Abraham and he could perhaps influence them. Maybe Abraham sent Eliezer on a fact-finding mission to see where they're holding, how they're doing, how they can be helped. Or perhaps Abraham wanted a checkup on his brother-in-law slash 
nephew Lot, see how he's doing amongst the worst company in the world. Maybe we could speculate even further. Whose wedding did Eliezer go to? So obviously we don't know the answer, but we do know that Lot had at least two married daughters. Last week's parsha, when they flee from Sodom, he has at least two married married daughters because he has a plural amount of sons-in-law. Maybe Eliezer snuck into Sodom to participate in those weddings to find out how Lot and his family are doing. Maybe this is just speculation. Maybe he was there, sent by Abraham to monitor Lot. It would make sense, obviously, why. Abraham himself would not want to go there. Maybe there's other reasons why Abraham didn't want to go there. But that is the first foreign trip of Eliezer, and we can be fairly certain that Abraham sent him. Well, there's a second mission that Abraham sent Eliezer on, and that relates to the War of the Five Kings against the Four Kings. Chapter 14, Parshas Lechlecha, we know the story. Lot is captured. Abraham is informed about it. He mobilizes a force. This is chapter 14, verse 14. Vayishma Avram, he's then called Abram, or Avram. He hears that Lot is taken hostage and he mobilizes his men, the people of his household, 318 people, and they chase and they pursue. They go to war and they win. Now the Torah tells us the precise amount of warriors that Abraham takes with him. If you think about it, this is a world war. It seems pretty bold of Abraham to go to war with only 318 people. But Rashi makes it even more lopsided. Rashi quotes the Talmud. The Talmud, the book of Nadar, on page 32a on the bottom. It tells us that Abraham did not take 318 different men. He took one man, Eliezer, and the gematria of the word Eliezer is 318. So it's just Abraham and Eliezer going to war, a world war. And not only that, things worked out. They won the war, and they regained all the people and all the treasure, and they also rescued Lot. And then the king of Sodom said, take everything. And Abraham responds, no, I'm not taking anything. I'm not going to take, not a string, not a shoe strap, nothing. But here is the second mission, prior, of course, to our Parsha, when Abraham sent Eliezer to Aram Naharim to go find a spouse for Isaac, we have first... Eliezer being dispatched to Sodom. And number two, we have the war of the five kings against four kings. And now Eliezer is sent on a third mission to go travel east to find a wife for Isaac. But here's where I want to formulate the question. There's a very interesting and frankly surprising statement in that aforementioned Talmud in the Book of Nadarm on page 32a on the bottom. The Talmud is wondering, what did Abraham do wrong to have his descendants condemned to 400 years of slavery and oppression? We know that Abraham was foretold, chapter 15 of Genesis, you should surely know that your children will be descendants, your descendants will be foreigners of foreign land, they'll be enslaved, they'll be tormented, they'll suffer, and after 400 years they'll go free. What did Abraham do wrong to merit that? So the Talmud gives three reasons. And one of the reasons is that Abraham sent Eliezer on a mission. Isn't that interesting? Amr Abba Omer Belazar. Why was Abraham punished? Vinishtab Duban of Limitzraim and his sons, his descendants, were enslaved to Egypt. Mipnei Sha'asa Angaria Betalmida Chacham. Because he conscripted Torah scholars. She never quotes the verse, Genesis 14, 14. He takes, he mobilizes the force and he goes to war. That's why you took Torah scholars away from their study. And that is such an unconscionable deed. As a result of that, Abraham is going to have to suffer that his descendants will be enslaved. What an amazing and frankly terrifying idea. Abraham was the founder of a movement. But he also had an academy. Avram Zakim Yosheb Yeshiva. He had an academy, and he had students who were studying together, and Abraham would teach. And Abraham's right-hand man in teaching was Eliezer. He's called Damesek Eliezer, chapter 15, verse 2. What does it mean, Damesek Eliezer? So Rashi tells us, according from the Talmud, Dole Umashke, it's a mashup of the word Dole, which means to draw water out of the well, and Mashke, to give others to drink. 
Eliezer was such an accomplished student of Abraham, he was able to draw from Abraham's wellsprings of Torah and share it with others. Eliezer was like Abraham's teacher's assistant. And then there's a war. And Abraham conscripts Eliezer away from the study and to go to war. Of course, it's a just war. It's a vital war. It's a necessary war. It's a war to save Lot. And Lot, of course, is going to be the forebearer of Moab and Ruth and David and Messiah. The mission of saving Lot can legitimately be called ensuring the perpetuation of the Messianic line. Yet because Abraham pulled them away from their studies, that flaw in Abraham, that mistake, that misdeed that Abraham did, that warranted that Abraham's descendants be subjected to 210 years of cleansing in Egypt. What a frightening Talmud. And again, don't trust me. Look it up yourself. Nadarm 32a in the bottom. So first of all, it shows us the sacrosanct importance of not interrupting Torah study for any trivial matter. The war to save Lot does not meet the necessary criteria. And because Abraham violated that, and he drafted Eliezer, Abraham's descendants will be enslaved in Egypt. So, of course, that's a very interesting Talmud, and there's a lot to talk about it. But here's the question vis-a-vis our discussion. Eliezer's study and teaching is sacrosanct. Saving Lot from the war of the four kings against the five kings is not a good reason to interrupt the studies. Abraham should have gone on his own. But here, Abraham is pulling Eliezer away from his studies to go find a spouse for Isaac. Apparently, that's not a problem. You know, initially we asked, Abraham should do it himself. You want a job done well, you got to do it yourself. But here we see that pulling away Eliezer for something that is not necessary for Eliezer to do, Abraham could do it himself, that's a real big problem. And of course, it's hard for us to understand why that would warrant, why that would justify 400 years of servitude. But nevertheless, it does amplify our question. Why does he send Eliezer? Why was sending him on this mission not a violation of taking scholars away from their studies? Abraham should have gone on his own. Abraham should not have sent Eliezer. Another angle that I want to ponder. The mission itself, if you look at what happened with Eliezer, it's very interesting because everything clicks. Everything works perfectly. He's firing on all cylinders. Eliezer experiences unprecedented divine assistance in his mission. So for one, we're told that the journey was expedited. The verse tells us, 2442, that Eliezer, when he's retelling the story to the family of Rebecca, he tells him, I came today to the well. So Rashi points out from the unusual structure of this verse, Hayom Yotzasi, today I left Canaan, Vahyom Basi, and today I arrived. This is a multi-day journey. But it happened like this for Eliezer. He was able to catch the, 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 go, the, the jet stream and to go fast. The land, in the words of the Talmud, jumped for him. This is a very rare miracle that happened for Eliezer. And by the way, according to the Targum Yonah Sun, it happened for him also on the way back. After finding Rebecca, the very next day, he's back in Canaan. So Eliezer, the whole trip, it takes two days. One day to get there and to go find Rebecca towards the evening, sleeping overnight, taking Rebecca back to Canaan and arriving that evening and encountering Isaac. All of chapter 24 happened in two days. There was a miracle that the land jumped. He was on like a moving sidewalk to be able to get there really fast. Now, this is a very rare miracle. According to the Talmud, the book of Sanitary, page 95a, it happened to only three people in history. Only Eliezer, the servant of Abraham, and Jacob, and Avishai ben Suruya, those three people, to the exclusion of everyone else. These three people alone had this very rare and unique miracle that the land jumped for them. Abraham went on many journeys. He went to Haran. He went to Canaan. He went over all over the land of Canaan. He went to Egypt. He went three days to Moriah. He went to Grace, constantly moving. But the land never jumped and expedited the way for him. 
But for his servant on this mission, it jumps. Now, as an aside, there's a very interesting teaching from Rav Dessler to explain the anatomy of this miracle. You know, it's really interesting to think about it. The land jumped and he was able to get to a destination fast. And every year, every summer, we drive to Canada. I'm always hoping to have some sort of miracle. You're driving, you know, 1,500 miles and like, come on, land, jump a little bit, a little bit, make this a little bit easier for me. But no, only three people in history. That's it. No one else. But for Eliezer, the servant of Abraham, he had this miracle. But what's the anatomy of this miracle? So Rav Dessler explains, we believe that the Almighty is completely in control of everything. Not only that, we don't believe that God created the world and set up systems and then went away. He is continually recreating the world perpetually. In fact, we say every day, daily prayer, ubetuvo mechadesh bechol yom tamim maseberches. God in his goodness is renewing bechol yom and every day, tamid, continuously, maseberches, the creation of Genesis. The fact that I exist, it's not because I was created, I was born in 1986 and I moved to Houston in 2012. And I went to the Torch Center this morning. The Almighty recreates me every single second. It happens to be that he recreates me in the, in the same place, in the same glorious torch center, on the same cheer, in front of this amazing, beautiful microphone. Behind me is this beautiful library. He happens to recreate me every second in the same place. And that happens almost all the time. But three times in history, the Almighty recreated someone in a different location. It's just as easy for God to create me here as it would be to create me in, I don't know, in Barbados or in Israel. It could happen. It's not difficult for God. He's just recreating the world every single second perpetually. And if he wanted, he could just recreate me and just teleport me, transpose me someplace else. And that would be easy for God. He just doesn't do that. Doesn't operate like that most of the times. Three times in history, he did that. Very interesting idea of the structure of this miracle. But isn't it interesting? This is this one rare miracle. Who does it happen to? It happens to Eliezer, the servant of Abraham, doing this mission. This is not the end of Eliezer's miracles on this two-day journey. He gets there. He arrives towards the evening in Aram Naharayim, in the city of Nahar. This is exactly where he needs to be. He goes to the well, and he starts praying. And what does he say? He says to God, the master of Abraham, listen to me, do kindness with me, do kindness with Abraham, my master. Behold, I'm standing on the well and all the girls are coming out and I don't know which one's a good candidate for Isaac. I'm going to devise this test. I'm going to ask the girl, give me some water and she will know not just to give me, but also to the camels and that will demonstrate that she has the kindness, requisite kindness needed to be part of Abraham's kindness dynasty. He sets up this whole prayer and inspection. And then verse 15, and again, we're in chapter 24 of Genesis. Before he even finishes speaking, he's scarcely done speaking. And boom, who comes out? Rebecca Riffer comes out and she is carrying her pitcher, her pail, and the entire system, the entire plan goes into motion. He asks her to drink and she gives him to drink and she gives to his camels as well. He gives her the jewelry. He finds that she's from the right family. Amazing things work out perfectly. But it's interesting. Eliezer is having miracle upon miracle happening to him. The land jumps for him. He submits a prayer. And the second he's finished, Rebecca walks out. He's answered immediately. Everything is flawless. And of course, Eliezer is realizing that this is very unusual. This doesn't happen usually. Usually, of course, we believe that every prayer works. Every prayer is efficacious on some level. But it's very rare to see you ask for something and the second you finished, it just walks out right in front of you. And Eliezer himself acknowledged as much in verse 27. He says, Baruch Hashem, blessed is God, the God of my master Abraham, who didn't abandon me. His kindness and his truth is with me at all times. Bederech Nechani Hashem, God has guided me along this path to the house of my master's brother. God is like holding my hand 
Eliezer realizes he's leading me. He's guiding me in the straight path, in this proper path, in this correct path. Rashi tells us exactly where I need to go. He's holding my hand, showing me what I need to do, walking alongside me and guiding me and being there with me. Eliezer is acknowledging that he is a recipient of very unique divine assistance and oversight. Providence. He's with him, holding me, guiding me, taking care of me. Miracles the entire way. Oh, and this is not the end. There are more miracles yet to come. There were people who objected to this match. So, of course, we know the story. He tells them the whole story and they say, well, it came from God. They sign off on it. And the next day, the family gets cold feet. And they say, this is in verse 55, her brother and her mother say, no, maybe she should stay here, maybe for 10 months, maybe for a year. What's the rush? So Rashi asks an interesting question. The previous day, Eliezer was negotiating with Rebecca's brother, Laban, and Rebecca's father, Besuel. And the mother was there, and Rebecca was there. But suddenly, it's the next morning, and the father is gone. He's talking only to her brother and her mother. Where is daddy? Where is Rebecca's father? Where is Besuel? So Rashi asks the question, Ubesuel, where was Besuel? He wanted to stop it. And an angel came, Vehimiso, and killed him. Besuel, he wanted to torpedo this union. And the angel came and killed him. So he was there yesterday. He's gone today. No one is stopping Eliezer's mission. And there was a midrash that I was always taught as a kid. The midrash, I, what I remember hearing is that Besuel, the father of Rebecca, the father of Laban as well, he wanted to torpedo this union and he made a poisonous dish for Eliezer. And the angel came and took his dish and swapped it with Basul's dish and Basul ate his own poison and that's how he died. I actually asked my wife yesterday, I said, did you hear that Midrash when you were a kid? She says, yes. Apparently this is the universal Midrash that everyone gets taught as children. But now we're adults, or at least we're pretending to be adults. So I said, you know what? Let me go look for a source. I always tell you, the faithful friends and family of the Parsha I say, don't trust me. I'm giving the sources. Go check it out. Don't believe me when I say something. Don't believe me. See what it says inside. Let me find this Midrash. So I did some looking for this Midrash. And I found it. Indeed, it's such. The Midrash says that. That he prepared a dish and he put poison in the dish and he put it in front of Eliezer. But the angel came and surreptitiously swapped the dishes. He had his own poison and he died. And then I continue to read the Midrash. And I'm like, ooh, this this part of the Midrash was not taught to me in school. This part was omitted from the curriculum. The Midrash says, in an alternative explanation as to why Basuel died, is because he was the local tyrant, dictator of the town. And there was a rule in this town that any virgin woman, when she's going to be designated for a man, Besuel, the father of Rebecca, would have to, I don't know what the right word is, but be with her, rape her essentially, and only then could she be handed to her husband. He was such a lowlife, such a rapist, such an awful, repugnant pervert. That's what he would do with every betrothed woman. That's what he would do. And there was a concern, says the Midrash, that he would do this with his own daughter. What a low life. What a low life. And in order that he does not sleep with his own daughter, Rebecca, the angel came and killed him. And again, this part was not taught to us in school. But anyhow, let's kind of zoom out a little bit here. We have Basuel here, and he is trying to stop Eliezer's mission. He tries to kill him, or he tries to somehow imperil the mission. Angel comes and kills him or swaps the plates, whatever it is. And the next day, Rebecca actually leaves her family the day after her father dies. So it adds some more color to the backstory. But think about what this means for Eliezer's mission. He's sent by Abraham 
go east, go find a spouse. And he, he gets the way expedited and he gets there right when he gets there. He does the prayer and right when he finishes the prayer, Rebecca watches out and it works out perfectly. And then someone tries to stop it and the angel comes and kills him. Eliezer's antagonist is dead by the next day. That's very unusual. You know, of course, in a few weeks, we're going to read about Jacob going to the same region and also having an antagonist who wanted to destroy him. Of course, that's Laban. But he had to endure 20 years of suffering under Laban. There was no angel that came and swapped the plates. No angel came and killed Laban middle of the night. Even when Laban was attacked, so to speak, by the angel in the dream after he pursued Jacob, he didn't kill him. There's a certain asymmetry here. Eliezer goes. Jacob goes. They both have antagonists. But somehow for Eliezer... By morning, the angel comes, this very unusual intervention, Besuel is dead. Jacob does not have that same miracle. So there's a whole string of miracles happening to Eliezer that are very unusual. And when he travels back with Rebecca in tow, he also has an accelerated journey. And he happens to bump right into Isaac along the way. What are the odds of that? Isaac is praying, and boom, they just happen to encounter each other. This is before cell phones and GPS, of course. This trip is being elevated by the Almighty, making it completely successful. And the question I want to pose, another kind of series of questions I want to pose, why did Eliezer merit such incredible divine aid? He has the expedited trip both there and back. God answers his prayers right away. He feels and he acknowledges God's guiding hand. Any detractors are killed by the angels. Eliezer vanquished the enemy in one day. Thanks to the angel's intervention. He bumps into Rebecca on the way there. He bumps into Isaac on the way back. What's going on? Why is Eliezer and his mission being protected by this divine Kevlar? Everything's working out. Any problem is being cast aside. So you have two series of questions here. Why was Eliezer sent to begin with? Abraham should go himself. Removing Eliezer from the study hall was not something that you do willy-nilly. Abraham does not appear to trust him, but sends him nonetheless. And why does Eliezer merit such unprecedented success in his mission? Why was he given such special divine oversight? So I want to suggest an approach to understanding the journey of Eliezer. This journey, this mission was very, very difficult for Eliezer. Abraham was looking for a spouse for Isaac. And there was a very suitable, fitting, and worthy candidate who lived right next door. Eliezer himself had a daughter that was righteous and kind and worthy and grew up in Eliezer's home adjacent to Abraham. He was a very righteous person, Eliezer was, and his daughter was a very fitting and worthy match for Abraham's son, for Isaac. If you think about it, Abraham is the greatest man of the world at the time. And then there's Isaac, of course. And after that, next in line is Eliezer. He is the one who drew from Abraham's Torah and dispensed it to the masses. We're told in the Midrash that Eliezer had such a firm grip on his Yetzirah the same way that Abraham did. He was Moshe B'chal Shalom. He had complete control in everything. He was in charge of his Yitzra. He was in control of the Yitzra, just like Abraham was. The Midrash also tells us that Eliezer, he's one of the few people that entered paradise, Gan Eden, alive. And his daughter was raised in his home. And she was righteous and pious and worthy and noble in every single way. But there was only one small little problem. Pedigree. Eliezer just happened to be a Canaanite, the nation whom Noah cursed. And therefore, when he proposed this, when he proposed this idea to Abraham, he says, you have a son, I have a daughter. It's perfect. Abraham told him the following painful and stinging statement. He said to him, you are cursed. My son is blessed. Never shall the two intertwine. 
Bani Baruch, my son is Baruch, is blessed. Va'ata Aror, and you're cursed. Ve'ain Aror Medabek Baruch, and these two cannot cleave together. This is an amazing thing, if you think about it. Abraham has to find a daughter-in-law. And we want a good girl, you know, raised in the proper environment, from a good family. And we have two potential candidates here. We have the family of Basuel, the tyrant pervert, the idolater general awful person. And we have Eliezer, the giant sage. Miracles are happening to him all the time. And Abraham tells him, sorry, your daughter is not a candidate. So that's painful, of course. But then Abraham apparently twists the knife. He's adding insult to injury. He says, I want to commission you to go find a spouse, not your daughter, someone else, for Isaac. And swear to me that under no circumstances we take a Canaanite woman for my son. Eliezer has some serious skin in the game. And Abraham indeed made him swear that he's not going to deviate from the instructions. Eliezer is cursed. Isaac is blessed, and the two cannot mix. This is, of course, very disturbing for us. You know, we believe in a meritocracy. And you should not be judged by the deeds of your antecedents. It's not Eliezer's fault that he was born a Canaanite. Personally, he was flawless. Yet, he was contaminated. How come Eliezer was not able to shed his status of being cursed? Was there no way for him to becoming blessed? Doesn't God tell Abraham, those who bless you, I will bless? If Eliezer could be the recipient of God's blessing, that would override the curse of Noah, you would imagine. So this was the question that was really bothering me. Eliezer's cursed, but does he have to remain cursed forever? That seems a bit inappropriate, a bit much. So yesterday I was actually doing some errands. I'm driving around the neighborhood, and I had a thought. I said, maybe that's what's actually happening over here. Maybe Abraham is putting Eliezer to do this mission, on this mission, in order to transform Eliezer from being cursed to being blessed. That was my idea. Total speculation. And I looked around, and guess what I found? The Midrash says it explicitly. He was cursed. Of course, not due to any deeds of his own. Because he comes from Ham, from Ham, and from Canaan, that is a nation that's cursed. It says it in Scripture. Noah did it. It's affirmed by Scripture. Eliezer was cursed. Because he did a mission for Abraham, because he serviced Abraham, he was transformed to being blessed. In fact, in our Parsha, verse 31 of chapter 24, when Laban welcomes Eliezer to his home, he says, ba, ba, come, Baruch Hashem, the blessed one of Hashem. This says the Midrash and the Zohar, multiple places I saw the same idea. This informs us that Eliezer, via doing what he did, was transformed from cursed to blessed. Here's the idea. Abraham knew that Eliezer was cursed. Of course, not due to any action on his own part. And he wanted to find a way to change Eliezer's status. And the only way that Eliezer would be able to shed his previous status is if he undertook a very difficult mission, indeed a mission that he thought was to his detriment. After all, he wanted Isaac for himself. And Eliezer executed his responsibilities completely, perfectly, faithfully, with incredible fidelity, Completely selflessly, Eliezer was asked to do something that was very, very difficult for him. And he did it with complete trustworthiness. Go to Aram Naharayim and find someone for the role that you think you deserve. Go hire your replacement. And he executes the mission with complete fidelity and trustworthiness. He gets there and you read the whole story. He's so happy to find what he's looking for and he prays with sincerity. He's genuinely interested in doing what Abraham commanded him to do. And in fact, he introduces himself. I'm the servant of Abraham. I'm totally submitted to Abraham. I'm not going to involve any of my own biases or agenda. What I want doesn't matter. 
My interests doesn't matter. I'm completely and totally beholden and subjected to Abraham. And he meets Rebecca's dad, a total rapist lowlife. And he's like, really? This is the family you think is better than mine? But never once does he veer from his mission. This combination of doing something that's right, that's appropriate, even though it's difficult, even though it's painful, even though you feel it's unjust and you feel that this is improper. And you do it with full integrity and full commitment and full devotion. Such a deed, that's the only kind of deed that can catapult Eliezer out of the category of cursed and into that of blessed. In Jewish philosophy, we have a name for this kind of deed. It's called lishma for its intended purpose. Doing something out of a total sense of duty. Not for any personal benefit. Maybe even you're willing to suffer something, to lose something as a result of what you're doing. But you're doing the right thing. And you're not allowing any of your own personal biases and interests to play a part. Such a deed, we're told, can permanently alter and transform the status of a person. The Rambam tells us that our greatest hope and yearning and pining is to earn a merit to be a citizen of Olam Abba, to be part of that rarefied group of people that end up living in eternity, basking in God's glory forever. And of course, to do that, we have to do a lot of mitzvahs. We've got to work our whole lifetime to get a golden ticket to Olam Abba. However, if someone does one mitzvah lishma, one mitzvah out of this sense of duty, out of love of God, commitment to the cause, that permanently earns the person who does it, Olam Abba. By undertaking and pulling off this mission, Eliezer did a deed lishma, and as a result of that, his status changed from being cursed to being blessed. And I think when someone undertakes this journey, there is an added benefit. There's the cherry on top. Look what happened to Eliezer. Eliezer is aided in all kinds of ways. His journey is expedited. His prayer is answered immediately. The Almighty clears away the enemies who want to kill him. He has the Almighty guiding him, holding his hand. If someone does this mission, if someone undertakes to do something like this, the Almighty will facilitate that. The Almighty will enable it. The Almighty will clear the path. Eliezer didn't want this. He wanted it, I said, for himself. But he did it nonetheless faithfully. Someone who has such dedication and devotion to the cause, even when it violates his best interest, even when he thinks it's unjust, it's not fair, someone like that unlocks divine assistance more than anyone else. In the whole history of humanity, it's only three people that had this great miracle of the land jumping. What Eliezer did was against his interest. He had a daughter to wed. It was a perfect match for Isaac. And going now to the family of Basuel to, to go secure Rebecca, it violated his sense of fairness. But he was nonetheless faithful to his mission. And as a result of that, he was transformed from cursed to blessed. That's why Abraham sent him. Abraham knew that there was a problem. He says, uh, you're swearing. There's not, there's not going to be any impropriety over here. But I want you to do it because it'll transform you. This is a very good reason to take Eliezer out of the study hall because it was for his benefit and his transformation. Eliezer has an interesting postscript. So, of course, once we finish our parsha, we don't hear from Eliezer again in Scripture. But according to the very interesting sources that talk about these kinds of things, we are told that Eliezer was reincarnated again. This time, he became a blessed member of Abraham's family. According to some of the versions, Caleb, of course, he's going to play a very prominent role in the book of Numbers in the episode of the spies. Caleb, that soul is none other than the soul of Eliezer. And when Caleb arrives to Canaan, he goes to Hebron, to Hebron, to go pray by Abraham's grave because he was the servant of Abraham. According to a different version of the sources that I saw, Joseph is a reincarnation 
Valiesa. So again, I don't know anything about reincarnation or how souls get migrated or transposed. I know nothing about that. But still, it's interesting that we find in these very reputable sources that Eliezer makes a comeback. He is now blessed. He's been transformed. And that's why Abraham sent him, to provide him the opportunity for his metamorphosis and transformation. I think the general idea is a very powerful lesson for us. Our whole life really is a mission, right? We're trying to do something here. In the story of Eliezer, we see that some of the things that we do in our lifetime are more consequential than others. The things that we need to do that are very difficult for us, they're painful for us, they go against our nature and against our interest. And it seems improper and unjust. It seems impossible for us to do it. Let's remember the metamorphosis of Eliezer, the saga, the odyssey of Eliezer, the journey of Eliezer. And remember what these missions entail. In these instances, we're being given the opportunity to completely reinvent ourselves. And we can be sure that once you commit yourself to that journey, once you sign the line that is dotted, once you accept, commit yourself to do this even though it's difficult, you faithfully accept the mission, you're going to be sure that you're going to be unlocking bountiful divine assistance to get you past the finish line. Okay, let's get to this week's exquisite insight. I'm still looking for a better word. I, I know it's been now, what, five weeks or so? It still feels weird to say exquisite insight. Maybe it's just too much of a tongue twister. I'm still in the market for a new idea, a new name. If you have any ideas, shoot me an email, rebelinjimbo.com. So here's this week's exquisite insight. Our partial begins with Sarah's death at the age of 127. It's not a very round number. You know, Moses dies at 120 and Abraham is 175 and Isaac is 180. Adam is 930. These seem to be round numbers. 127 is a very kind of haphazard, strange number. But this number actually appears again, one more time, in Scripture, in the most unusual of places. In the beginning of the book of Esther, we're told that Ahasuerus, he ruled over 127 countries. So we have Sarah dying at 127, and we have Ahasuerus, who's subsequently going to marry Esther, of course. He rules over 127 countries. So, of course, they seem to be totally unrelated, but there's a fascinating Midrash that connects the two. The Midrash tells us that Rabbi Kiva was sitting and giving a discourse. And the crowd was getting a little droopy. They were getting tired. They wanted a nap. So what did he say? In the middle of his lecture, he interjected and said the following. Why did Esther merit to rule over 127 countries? Why? Because she is the descendant of Sarah, and Sarah lived for 127 years, and therefore it made sense that the daughter of Sarah, who lived 127 years, should rule over 127 countries. Thus concludes this very strange comment in the Midrash, Precious Rabbah, 58.3. Seems like such a random Midrash that was sleeping, and then he drops this quirky curiosity to wake them up, apparently. Gets their attention. What's going on in this Midrash? So there are lots of connections, apparently, between Sarah and Esther. On a very basic level, Sarah, of course, was abducted from her husband by the most powerful king in the world, Pharaoh. Esther was also abducted from her husband, which was Mordechai by the most powerful king in the world. And both of them stayed true to their faith in a very hostile environment. What is the merit for this kind of resilience and perseverance? This incredible reward. In the merit of Sarah staying true to her faith, Esther unlocks or displays or exhibits 
manifest the reward for that. But my incredible brother-in-law, Rabbi Shmuley Botnik, he shared with me the following mind-bending, exquisite calculation. Where does Esther feature in the Torah? Where does she appear in the Torah? So the Talmud tells us, well, of course, she, she was born way afterwards. The story of Esther happened hundreds of years after Moshe's death. But nevertheless, there's a hint to Esther foretelling about Esther in the Torah. Va'anochi hastir astir panabayumahu. I will conceal my face. Hastir astir. I will surely conceal my face at that day. Says the Talmud. Hastir astir is from the word or from the same show or same root as the word Esther. God will conceal his face. Anochi, God. I will conceal my face in that day. Even when things are bad, God is hidden. Anochi, which is the first word of the Ten Commandments, don't forget God. Perhaps, suggested my brother-in-law, Esther, her essence is that she was hidden. She was hidden as a Jewess in Ahasuerus' court. And she never forgot the Anochi. She never forgot her connection to God. She remained true to her faith, even in a terrible environment. And here's the clincher. How many times does the word Anochi appear in the Torah? Drum roll, please. If you're still around listening more than 50 minutes into this podcast, you could do a drum roll with your finger. Drum roll, please. 127 times in the Torah, the word Anochi appears. And then continue my brother-in-law. Students, they were falling asleep. What does it mean the students were falling asleep in Rabbi Kiva's lecture? How could you fall asleep in Rabbi Kiva's lecture? There's a deep message to that as well. They were falling asleep. They were getting disenchanted. They were getting depressed. There's difficult times. Of course, Rabbi Kiva marks the era of the destruction of the temple. The nation was heading into exile. They were like a, like a prince who's being surrounded by enemies now, or being forced to be immersed in the home of enemies. It's difficult times, and they're depressed, and they want to just sleep it off. And Rabbi Akiva is reminding them about our great heroines of yore and their indomitable spirit and resolve in the face of great challenges. They were both kidnapped. They were both taken hostage away from their people to a very dangerous and impure place. And they withstood these great challenges and they earned tremendous reward as a result. When things get tough, we never forget the Anochi. Even in Hastir Astir, if things are very bad, we don't forget the Anochi. We don't forget that we are a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. We don't forget who we really are, a nation at our peak. We're the ones who spoke to God directly. We have God on our side. We're going to make it through. I thank you for listening to this edition of the Parsha Podcast. What's my name? Who is this person talking to you? Well, my name is Yaakov Wolpe. And I happen to work for Torch. In Houston, Texas. And this is the Parsha Podcast. Send me an email. Well, what's your email? If you look down at the bottom, the description of the podcast, it has my email. But if you don't want, the email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com. Thank you for listening. Have an amazing and splendid and terrific rest of your day. A fabulous and sensational and terrific rest of your week. And a marvelous, stupendous incredible Shabbos upcoming. Please don't help with the Almighty. We'll talk again next week.